Hello and welcome to today's Infopedia web conference. This is Microsoft Dynamics 365 for Operations Tech Talk. Today's topic, Warehousing Mobile App. Presenting for us today for Microsoft, we have Senior R&D Solution Architect, Z Zach Greenvoss. So without any further delay, Zach, the floor is all yours. Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to this Fast Track Tech Talk. Today, we'll be covering the new Microsoft Dynamics 365 for Operations Warehousing Mobile App. I'll be covering why we have introduced this new feature, what is different and unique about it, how you can install and configure it, a brief demo on how we can use the app, and some general rules around the user interface. Finally, uh, assuming we have time, I'd like to cover some of the extensibility story around building new functionality on top of the mobile app. My name is Zach Greenvoss, and I'm a solution architect in the R&D group, focusing on the SCM and distribution area. Some of you might know my work um, when I was in the warehousing team, and I published several articles on the WMDP framework um, and how to build custom applications on top of that. And we'll be talking a little bit around that sort of that functionality as well. So hope you're excited. I am. So should be good. Here's our agenda. I want to take a little time to discuss the background of the WMDP and mobile app so we can understand how we got um, to the decision to build the mobile app. We're going to focus on the changes to the connection model between WMDP and the mobile app. Next, I plan to give you an overview of the user interface and how it might be different than what you are used to from the previous WMDP offering. Then I really want to dive into how to install and configure the app so you can get up and running on your own system. This can be a little tricky. So we'll spend some time examining each step required. Then I can show you some of the workflows in the new app and hopefully provide a solid understanding of how the app operates in different screens and workflows. Um, finally, as I said, if we have time, I want to discuss with you the extensibility story and how you can build custom solutions um, on top of this technology. So I hope that's exciting for you. A little background on how we got here. The Warehouse Devices Mobile Portal, uh, or WMDP as I've been referring to it, is the existing platform for delivering mobile support to RF and mobile devices. This was largely designed for an on-premise workload and has a basic assumption of connecting to an on-premise you know, AX or Dynamics 365 um, system. This worked great for AX 2012 R3, however it does not uh, operate very well with our new managed cloud platform. We do have many customers using the WMDP um, you know, against a Dynamics 365 for operations cloud. However, they are forced to install a local server and run it, man run it manually or push it to another Azure VM and host it there. Neither of these options are included in the licensing costs for Dynamics 365 for operations, meaning customers are having to take on the additional Azure costs themselves. Another common concern we often hear is that the user interface on the mobile app uh, for the WMDP leaves something to be desired. Um, we did intentionally build it to be simple and supportable across a, a wide range of devices. However, what we are seeing in the warehouse and distribution landscape is that uh, most newer devices that manufacturers are coming, with, coming out with are you know, coming out with full-featured Android operating systems, including rich application and web browser support. These newer devices often leave our WMDP app looking out of place and old-fashioned with a limited set of features. Finally, we have found the WMDP installation and supportability process to be an area of weakness and something that is slowing down our implementations. One of the goals of the Fast Track um, and ultimately the R&D team is to ensure customers and partners can quickly and reliably implement Dynamics 365 for operations with a minimum of extra setup and processing time. Removing this extra WMDP component or server from the mix definitely facilitates that goal. So that brings us to the design of the new warehouse mobile app. This app allows us to target a new set of form factors as the user interface is adaptive and can handle both smaller screen devices as well as larger tablets and surfaces. The entire visual look and feel of the experience has been reworked and redesigned for efficiency. We worked with the user experience team at Microsoft and several customer workshops to come to a good understanding of what types of data should be displayed and workflows supported. The entire application has been designed around touch so that a worker can quickly process the required workflow. Let me pause here and comment on some of the concerns we have heard about this approach. 
We understand that you might have a significant investment in existing devices that work well with the existing HTML-based model of the WMDP. These are often older devices that you might have had for many years. Many of these devices are running Windows CE or other legacy embedded operating systems. One factor that is critical to understand our approach is that the support for Windows CE is ending in 2020. What this means is that newer device manufacturers are not putting embedded Windows on their devices. Instead, they're putting Android or Windows 10 embedded, both of which have an app model that allows us to build a richer and better suited application that is simple HTML web form. So while we understand that this transition period will be challenging for some, we believe this is the correct long-term strategy for everyone's benefit. So all that being said, the app is installable on any Android 4.3 or greater device and any Windows 10 device. This means it'll work on a Windows phone, Windows laptop, as it is a, win a universal app. So you'll see me later demonstrating the app installed locally on my system here. The app is currently available now in the Google Play Store and the Microsoft Store uh, for Android and Windows 10, respectively. Also, you'll need a specific version of Dynamics 365 for operations. We have this natively included in the August release last year, also known as Update 3 or version 1611. Um, if you have, if you're still running the RT, RTW version, what was called Dynamics AX7, you will need to update to Platform Update 2 and install the listed hotfix there on the screen. So while we don't have any specific recommendation for devices, we have been working with device manufacturers such as Zebra and Honeywell to ensure that our new app works with their most popular devices. As you can see, all of these specific devices have been tested and work with the new app. However, any device that runs Android or Windows 10 should work fine. As I mentioned, one of the biggest changes to the framework is a different way to connect back to the Dynamics 365 for Operations cloud. In the previous system, we have an intermediate WMDP server hosted in IIS uh, that translated the XML communication from the AOS or Dynamics 365 for Operations into HTML for the devices. Now, this model is still currently supported in the fall release of Dynamics 365 for Operations, but will eventually be deprecated in favor of the new warehouse mobile app. In the new system, we have built a new custom interface in the cloud, which the native app connects to directly and uses the returned XML to build the user interface. The IIS server is not required here, as the app itself acts as the translation service and can build the required native controls and workflow directly from the XML sent from Dynamics 365 for operations. As we discussed previously, this app has been built to support a touch-first interface. The UI is built in such a way as to allow even warehouse workers who are wearing gloves to hit the buttons and UI elements in the app. This was a common feedback we heard from the previous uh, WMDP-based implementation. We've also worked hard to simplify the user interface so the worker has the information he or she needs for the current workflow step. In the WMDP model, we would often push a lot of information to the screen at once, and it was sometimes unclear what was being asked of the user. We have reimagined the UI to instead always focus on the current step and provide ways of accessing the supplemental information in a secondary screen if necessary. The UI will also scale up much more effectively now and can support a wider variety of screen sizes and user interface types. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of some of the differences between the WMDP-based model and the new warehousing mobile app. The WMDP design is built as a simple HTML form and the details can seem a little jumbled together and hard to read ultimately. It is also difficult to tell at a glance what input field you are on and what is expected to be entered. We would often get feedback that this was confusing to new and temporary warehouse users using the system. As you can see on the right, we have redesigned the UI to focus on the current request to the user, which is the item ID in this case. Now this is a scannable field, so we could accept a barcode or a keypad entered value. The example on the left also shows the issue with supporting touch-based interfaces. It has clearly been designed for a stylus 
or mouse input, which often does not make sense in a warehouse environment. The new app has less visual clutter and wider input areas, allowing for a strictly touch-based interaction. In addition, all of the buttons that you see on the left have been moved into a menu bar accessible from that icon in the top right corner of the app. This hopefully keeps us from having to scroll in the new app. We have tried to keep everything in a single screen, if possible. I'm now going to walk you through the new mobile app UI and give you some idea of the design language used. Hopefully this will help you to come up to speed quickly in your own implementations. You can see the general UI here. This is a screenshot from the Windows 10 app that is installed locally or can be installed locally. We'll be looking at this natively live a little bit later as well. First area to focus on is the primary data entry area. As I was saying earlier, this is always the specific piece of data that is being requested from the warehouse worker. This field supports scanning a barcode for data entry, although it's also possible to use a hard or attached keyboard. Since this is, field is always listening to the keyboard, any devices that simulate a keyboard entry with a carriage return will work as well. And we have quite a few devices using a paired Bluetooth scanner, which simply interprets the barcode and returns it as a string to the device. This works perfect perfectly well in this mode. If you click into that area or start typing, you'll move to a supplementary data entry screen, which you can see in action you know, a little, little later. And this ex current example is just a text box, but there can be other data entry options here as well, such as a keypad or a pick list, if it's that type of a field. For numeric fields like quantity, we also support an easy increment decrement control. This also supports keyboard entry, and an often requested feature is the ability to scan barcodes to increase the quantity. This field supports this mode. It doesn't read the barcode data, but it allows a worker to quickly implement the field by scanning items in a carton, for example. If you do click into that quantity field for data entry, it will pull up this large button calculator for ease of numeric data entry. This could be an easy way to calculate number of items per pallet, for example. Um, and the final value is pushed back to the quantity control on the main screen. Go back to the main UI page. One uh, major advance that this UI provides us is the ability to always see the last scanned value at the top of the screen. The legacy WMDP didn't really have this feature, although it was a common request. This allows the warehouse worker to see what was just entered, which can be important if they're interrupted in the middle of a workflow, for example. In this case, you can see they have just scanned the work ID and are now being told to go to the bulk 001 location and scan to confirm the location. As I was saying earlier, the previous WMDP solution would simply throw all data available on the work line to the screen, often overwhelming the user with too much data. We have changed this model to bring forward a set of key data points in the summary data section here. Now this is configurable, but will only show three lines of data at any one time. I'll show you later how priority groups can be used to indicate which data you want to elevate to this area. Uh, any additional data available on this menu item will be pushed to the detail page or detail tab. So this brings us the two tabs at the top of the screen. The first is the task tab, which is what's highlighted now. Um, this is the primary one and the default you start on with, with each workflow. Um, the detail tab can be switched to if the user needs to see any additional data. So as I was saying, the first tab is one we to focus on. Um, it shows the current requested data and the summary fields with the most relevant data for the user at that time. Detail tab displays all fields available for that specific menu item, and any requested input data will be flagged with an edit icon. This provides a similar user experience to the current WMDP workflow, showing all the fields and allow the user to select one for data entry, for example. Finally, we have the various buttons that used to be at the bottom of the WMDP screens. These have all been moved into what we call the hamburger icon in the top right. Clicking this icon will display the available actions for the user at that step in the workflow. Note that the OK button is always the default when the user clicks the enter or return key on their device or clicks the button displayed at the bottom of the screen. 
Okay, so now we walk through some of the basics of the UI and the new mobile app. I will give you a live demo of that, some of those workflows in a little later. But first, I do want to cover exactly how to get this app up and running in your own environment. We'll be walking through each of these steps in some detail, actually. Note, we also have a configuration guide on the wiki. The link is here at the bottom. Much of what I'll be explaining is detailed here. However, I will be covering um, how to do uh, all of this in the new Azure portal, and the wiki covers sort of the older Azure portal. The first step is to create an application in your Azure Active Directory tenant. In the new portal, you can navigate to Azure Active Directory, click the App Registrations link. This will show you all the currently registered applications in your AAD. Note that we use this model for all of the integration apps. So you might have done this for OData or Power BI integrations as well. You're going to want to create this new application as a web app or an API. This will allow you to create the secret key you need later. Another important element is the sign-on URL. This needs to be the base URL of your Dynamics 365 for Operations environment plus the string OAuth. Uh, failure to put in the correct string here could impact other applications in your tenant. As with any integration application, you need to add the required permissions to the Dynamics application. Uh, this tells Dynamics 365 for operations that the incoming requests from this integration application are valid. Finally, you'll need to create a secret key. You can create this key with an expiration date, and the value is displayed only when you create it. It is not viewable afterwards. So you're going to need to copy that value, and you'll use it on the client device in lieu of a username or password. So note that the above steps are currently recommended for each device. You need to create an application ID for each mobile device you want to have access to the system. While well, it is possible to share application ID across physical devices, if one is lost or stolen, there's not an easy way to revoke access unless you are tracking the devices separate in, in your Azure Active Directory. I do know that this can be a bit of an overhead to maintain these applications in the AAD, and the R&D team is currently working on trying to make this process a little easier to manage. Within Dynamics 365 for operations, you'll need to create a user that will perform the operations on the AOS side. So this should be a warehouse mobile device user role. It will give them minimum security access required to use uh, the application. So all of the typical user account creation rules would apply here as well. Another setup that is fairly new, um, is that must, but must be performed, is the system administration setup Azure Active Directory uh, applications in Dynamics 365 for operations. So this is a form that maps the incoming application IDs to users within Dynamics 365 for operations. Anytime an integration application is calling a custom service, which is what the warehousing app does um, behind the scenes, we must have a way of mapping the incoming application ID to a Dynamics user, which will run the AOS code, essentially. So this form allows us to associate the application IDs, or client IDs is what they're called here, with the specific WMDP users you created previously. Now, and this is where you could quickly revoke access if a device happened to disappear from your warehouse. As I said, this is the way any custom service can authenticate a user with a secret key, thus removing any need for a static username password stored on the device itself. All right, now we can talk about a few new configuration changes that were introduced to support this mobile app. The first deals with the app field names. This is a configuration inside Dynamics 365 for operations and allows you to control the primary input area for specific field types. What this means in practice is that you can show or disable this scanning interface that I showed you and configure if you want the numeric input data entry for a field. All of this is controlled through metadata and we provide a set of defaults for you, but any new fields that you add will need to be configured in the same way. So your quantity field has been configured to be a numeric data entry field, obviously. The other configuration unique to the mobile app is the app field priority settings. This is what controls the fields displayed at the bottom of the main task form. 
Again, this is all controlled through metadata and be configured through the Dynamics 365 for Operations UI. So you can see here that I've added the inventory status field to the third line, all just through the configuration of the priority groups. So the previous, and then I've added that inventory status to that third line. So how are these areas configured? Within the warehouse management menu area, you can see these are two new options under the mobile device setup section. These will be what drives the configuration for these new elements. When you first launch these pages in a new legal entity, the configuration will be blank. Um, you, and you might be confused why the UI in the mobile app does not match what you were expecting. For example, if you just launched it without doing any of this configuration, you won't get that scanning user interface. So I wanted to make sure I sort of brought this up um, to talk about this, because this is a re sort of required first step. Um, so when you're ready to configure a new legal entity for use with the mobile app, you can simply hit this Create Default Setup. This will populate all of the warehouse fields with the Microsoft recommended settings. Right, so this is what it's going to look like after you hit that. All fields that are defined in any of the warehousing flows will be in this table with a default input mode and input type. So the input mode will control what is displayed on that main task tab when it is the requested data from the warehouse worker. So scanning, which is that top selection, will display the scan interface and expect you to scan the data from a barcode. Manual input will simply display a te text box and will expect the data to be typed into the field. The input type controls what type of input data to expect for this field. You can select numeric or alpha to control whether or not the calculator input is displayed for a field. The date and selection options are actually restricted for specific field types, obviously dates and pick lists respectively. This screen controls the priority groups. This is that other menu option we saw, the priority groups for the supplemental data displayed at the bottom of the main task tab. Again, when you first enter this for a legal entity, it will be blank. Clicking the Create Default Setup will populate the default priority groups. So it'll look like this. Now, you'll be able to configure this data sort of as you see fit. The different priority groups are used to group the data in the different lines on the main form. Remember, though, only three lines are ever displayed. So the app looks to see what data is available for this menu item and pulls the top three priority groups with data and displays them in that specific order. Data within the same priority group will be grouped on the same line. And then remember, all data will be available on that detail tab, even if it's not in that first page. So the next couple of configurations are required. However, they're unchanged from you know, previous either Dynamics 365 versions or even AX 2012 R3 versions. So first you'll need a warehouse worker um, to sign into the app. So this is different than that warehouse user we created earlier. This is the login used by the user on the mobile device itself. And the previous uh, option really was the security user running the operations on the AOS. As I said, this is really unchanged from the, even all the way back to the AX 2012 R3 release. Finally, we get to the menu and the menu items configuration. Again, this process remains unchanged, and you can configure the same menu items and the same configuration options for each. All of these settings are carried over to the new mobile app. I think that's an important point to realize is that all of the menu items that are supported in the WMDP are supported in the new mobile app. Okay. So finally, we get to the app itself. There is a connection settings screen available from the initial login page. From here, you can configure demo mode, which just means it will show you some workflows with no connection to a backend Dynamics 365 for operations server. You can use this to play around with the app and maybe to show to others in your organization uh, before going through this process of configuring everything. Assuming you don't want to operate in demo mode, however, we can switch that off and fill in these necessary fields. The client ID there is the application ID GUID that we created in Azure Active Directory. The client secret is the application key we created in the Azure Active Directory. That was the one with the duration that we could set. 
basically this is the root URL of your Dynamics 365 for operations environment. Uh, make sure that you do not include a slash at the end of the URL. I know that some other applications that has caused some problems with authentication. So this is your Azure Active Directory um, tenant, and it's essentially the login URL, which just means that you append your Active Directory tenant ID to the standard log login.windows.net URL. And the tenant ID is typically the root URL of your domain. Finally, it's obviously just the legal entity you want this user device to be associated with. Uh, to change to a different legal entity will require a different set of connection settings. Um, you can't switch between legal entities without re-logging on and changing these values. All right, so that was a lot of configuration, but hopefully you can go back and, and use this to cover exactly what you need to do to get the mobile app up and running in your environment. So just to quickly review, we created an application in your Azure Active Directory, including assigning permissions and creating a secret key. We created a warehouse app user account to associate to the custom endpoint. We added the AAD application configuration with Dynamics 365 for operations, which associated the warehouse user with a specific application ID for incoming integration calls. We configured the default setup for the app group field names and app field priority. We set up worker users and configured the necessary menu and menu items, just as we would have in previous versions. And finally, we set the necessary configuration options within the connection screen in the app itself. Okay, so hopefully that all made sense. So let's take a look at the app in action now. So uh, as I was saying, I have this app um, installed locally on a, my Windows 10 machine. Um, you can see it here. I can uh, log off. You can see the connection screen I was talking about here, connection settings. I have it not set to demo mode, so I actually have it connecting to a, an actual uh, environment that I have that we can take a look at as well. Um, I can log in to this device. It will authenticate. It will communicate with that custom service and pull in the, the XML. Um, so what I want to do is just walk through sort of a couple um, standard flows just so you can see how this app uh, operates with flows that you might be used to. Um, so first thing we'll do is I have some sales orders that I need to pick. So again, so this is the, the sales picking workflow. I can, at this point, I could scan uh, a work ID, um, but for my purpose, I don't have a barcode scanner attached to my laptop. I'll click in here and I can type in my work ID. I'm sure it's right. Okay, so you can see it's showing me the last scan value here. It's showing me that um, priority groups that's been bubbled up, that data that's been bubbled up. So I know that I need to go um, pick. Um, it's asking me a, um, a license plate to pick from, which I will be about Hey, I have uh, item confirmation turned on, so it's asking me to confirm this item. Okay, uh, I think I'm doing it again. And it's asking me to select the quantity. So again, I could I could use these increment decrement buttons to change that. Um, also, I can click in um, and I can do some sort of simple calculations if I wanted to by changing it to that, or I can simply hit um, five back and then I have five pieces. Okay, I'll have a target license place. All right, and it's gonna show me a summary screen of where I'm, I need to place this item at the bay door location. You can see the, I have associated the uh, item with the image, which is it's displayed in the mobile app. And assuming everything is good, I can click okay and the work is completed. You can see here that that work completed sort of area has been dropped down to the bottom as well. All right, so let's take uh, another sort of quick look at that process. I have another work that's ready to go. This one is a batch enabled item. So it's asked me to um, pick this location. Uh, I think I remember that license plate. Okay, so now I have this new item, A0003, which is batch enabled. 
confirm this item. Again, this would normally just be a sort of a quick scan. Um, what I want to do is show you that we have a, on that details tab, we have more information available here than what is being displayed in the task tab, obviously. Um, so this is where it's showing that sort of the rest of that information. Another thing to highlight is, and we'll talk about this later too, is that this app um, supports sort of scaling up. So if we were running this maybe on a Surface or a tablet, um, we could be displayed in this mode, which would show us sort of all of the relevant information. It actually drops those two tabs and just goes ahead and displays all of the information that might be interesting to you. Um, okay. And then go ahead and put And we're going to scan the batch number. We'll get that one. Let's find that. And then, as we were saying, all of that, all of those menu items that might have been, all of the buttons that might have been at the bottom of the WMDP have all been pulled up into this menu up here. And so, if I wanted to, I should have shown this earlier, but if I wanted to like short pick, um, I could have done that up in the from pulling from this option up here. Okay. I'll click OK, and that work will be done. So in like in this case, if I wanted to go back, that cancel button is pulled up into this hamburger menu. You can see all of the different menu items that, that we ship out of the box are still here. This is all the demo data menu items that you've probably seen before. So what if I that was a kind of an outbound flow? Um, what if I wanted to do an inbound flow? So I want to do a purchase order receiving. So I have a, a PO that's ready to, to be scanned here. Again, I'm entering it manually here, but it would be very easy to scan this on a barcode. So we're going to scan uh, this item again. Okay. And you can see, again, we can see those options there in the upper upper right corner of that hamburger menu, as we call it. Okay. So I'll enter in five pieces. If I had a pick list, I were able to choose um, the unit of measure that's coming in. In this case, my only choice here is pieces, but this is where I could pick the unit. Okay. And you can see here that the work was completed. Um, quickly take a look at what that'll be. We can do a purchase order um, put away as well. So we can do this put away for that same work. Um, so I just grab this work that was just created for that. And you can see it's showing you the summary screen for what we need to pick from the receiving bay um, and, and where we need to take that. And so we're, we're picking that up. And then, so this is, this is the, the user grouping menu item where I can sort of pick up multiple things from the receiving bay. Um, and then once I'm done um, with that, I can click this done button. That was an option in the WMDP. That was an option sort of in the main screen and so now that I'm done, I want to click this done button and it'll tell us, okay, now take, you know, what you've grabbed from that receiving bay and bring it to this location, FL002. Right? So that hopefully is uh, clear in terms of what we're asking those warehouse users to do. Okay? And then work is completed at that point. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Um, we can take a look at a couple other sort of flows. I wanted to show you a movement flow that's a little different. Um, so if we wanted to move um, a license plate, let me that license plate we used before. Um, so this is actually going to show us all of this information that's available for that license plate. Um, so you can see what we scanned up here, and this is the license plate that we're moving, the quantity, which I could um, click in and change that quantity if I needed to, but by default, I'm going to scan that license plate, like maybe it's a pallet, um, and maybe I want to, to move it to a, new, to a new area. So if I clicked OK, and this is where I want to move it to, it's sort of showing me that summary information on the bottom there. If I wanted to move, um, I have a license plate, name this, and so that's now, we've now moved sort of that entire license plate to this other license plate or, or location. Another thing we can do with this app um, is... We can do things like item or location inquiry. So if I wanted to take a look at sort of everything that was in my FL001 location, um, 
application. You can see that I have these two different license plates. So it's showing these two different license plates and then with these different items and how many are available there. Take a look at maybe a more complex location. Maybe not, but you can see a different location here with um, batch enabled. So you can actually see these batch numbers here. Uh, likewise, we can also do an item inquiry. So we can scan an item. The one we've been using a lot has been this one. I mean, you can see these are the different locations and sort of what, what is available at these different locations. Obviously, this does scroll, which, you know, I was telling you earlier that we try not to have it scroll, but um, in this one, and since there's a lot of data, it does scroll down. Okay. Lastly, I just want to show um, that. So we also support this work list, which is something we introduced um, in R3, uh, one of the CUs for R3. And so this lists all of the all of the work, and you can actually configure this um, in uh, in the application in, in Dynamics 365 for Operations UI. You can control sort of how this work is displayed and what gets displayed. Uh, but this one is a good one to show, you know, sort of the adaptive nature of the app. I um, mean, you can click on any of these work headers and start that work, you know, so if I wanted to, um, you know, if I'm a warehouse, you know, maybe a forklift, forklift operator and I want to see what's available at the bay door, I can see this and I can click on it and I can actually start that work right then. Um, so I could scan the license plate and begin that work. Um, so I think that's a, I think the work list is a pretty nice feature as well. So here you can also see that short pick. Okay. Let me come back to here. See that. Great. So I just wanted to cover a bit about some of the technical details of the app. Um, so first, let's be clear about what makes up the page. So we saw most of these in action just now, uh, but just to be clear, there are different sections of the page. So this app will always contain these nine sections, some of which might not be populated for a specific menu item or workflow, but they're always going to be available. So we have the, we've been talking a lot about this primary input area. Um, we have what we call the instruction text, like telling the user what to do. We have that secondary information area, which you can kind of control through those priority groups. We have what we call the subheader, which is usually, again, sort of supplementary or, or instruction text to the user. Um, we have the details, which is where everything sort of else that doesn't fit into those priority groups is pushed over onto that tab. We have an image, if available. Obviously, any errors that we hit are, are in there. Um, and that is, I didn't really, I didn't show you, but that is a, a field where if you click on it, it will show you the rest of that error. Um, so it'll, it, you can see the full text of the error. That was another problem we often had with that WMDP. You couldn't see the full text of the error. Again, the primary action, which in almost all cases is the OK button or the, the return key will, will trigger that. And finally, any secondary actions which are pushed up into that hamburger menu up above. So again, um, these nine, it's these nine are always available for a page. And we, um, they might not have any data, in which case they'll just be empty, but these nine sort of page elements are always going to be what makes up the app. When the app is resized or the mobile device is rotated, these nine components are moved around on the device, uh, but they're still all available to the user. Uh, so, like I showed you, when the app is expanded or run on a tablet interface, these same nine components are resized, and we try to make the best use of the available space in the most efficient manner. So, how does that all work sort of behind the scenes? So these nine different sections are independent and can be resized and repositioned on the device depending on the specific screen and scaling factor. Now within the AOS, we have logic that will assign different data controls to these nine sections depending on the workflow being executed, sort of what the previous and the next steps are. Essentially, we were able to derive most of the WMDP UI into a few simple rules that can be applied to the data to assign it to one of these nine controls. 
And once this is assigned in the AOS code, the mobile app obeys these instructions and displays the data in the nine different sections. Now, all of these rules are available within X++ code and can be overridden in custom warehouse solutions. Now, note though, you still only have these nine control sort of areas to work with. The logic you have access to, to change or the allocation or the prioritization of these data elements, you don't actually have control over the UI uh, of the mobile app itself. Just to illustrate how this is different than the WMVP, this is what we had in the previous version. The WHS work execute display classes um, built the workflow necessary for the specific screens. Then the base class, WHS work execute display, handled the logic of building both the UI and translating that into the XML, which was then pushed out of that um, custom service, which then was used by that IIS to translate into HTML. So in this new model, we kind of split this up a bit. Let's keep expanding this. The WHS work execute display drive classes still function in the same manner. In fact, they're fairly unchanged. And the abstract UI is still built by the WHS work execute display class. However, we have now added in device specific XML translator classes into the mix. So you'll either generate the legacy XML for the WMDP or the WHS mobile app XML translator will examine the UI and use a set of what's called decorator rules to determine where exactly the UI element should be placed in those nine control areas. And then all of this is exposed by a new custom service and that is returned to the device and the device uses that XML to build and, and show the UI ultimately. Okay, so I hope that's somewhat clear. Um, I did want to take a quick look so I am assuming that most people on this call are familiar with uh, this blog post. And so this is a blog post that we wrote in the warehousing team about how to build custom solutions on the mobile device. And so it explains the WHS works execute code. It explains where to add in the, the code to sort of build your own workflows, All right? So I thought it would be good um, if I could show you that same demonstration, which was a, a way, we called it a way container workflow, where um, as part of a process, you wanted to add in a container and then weigh the container and then save that. It was a fairly simple sort of state-based model, uh, but I wanted to show that that same exact workflow can work in this new mobile app. All right, so you have here, and I can, um, we can share this code afterwards, but we have here the code that's essentially been mapped over from that, that same demo, largely unchanged. So we have this um, WHS works execute display container weight, which derives from WHS work execute display class. And again, the display form that actually sort of builds that UI and processes the state machine, this is unchanged. The one area that is different that will be important for you if you are going to build solutions is that any sort of field that you are adding in, so in my case, I'm adding in this container ID and weight. Now, the container ID does not exist in any other warehouse flows, right? So I had to build a new class that extended the WHS field. And as you can see on my screen, make it a little bigger, I realize it might be too small. You can see that this is where we get those defaults for the app field priority um, and the input mode. So in and then that, sorry. That is going to allow you to expose that same data to the warehousing workflows that you need. There, looks like we're back. Sorry about that. Um, so you can see that I've set some of these priorities and sub-priorities. Um, I've set the input mode, and, I, and ultimately, it's this um, attribute 
that sort of connects that um, type, the WHS container ID type, to this class. And then when I was adding in the container ID, I made sure that I'm telling the UI that I'm using this specific extended type, and it uses that to um, sort of map that class to that field type. Yep, so I hope, hope that's clear. Zach, uh, I'm sorry yep. to interrupt. It looks as though we lost your presentation, so you'll need yeah. to share out your desktop again. Yeah, sorry about that. Looks like there's some network hiccup. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see that now, um, and then we can just quickly take a look. I remember where I put that. All right, way container. So this is a new custom flow um, that I've added in. And we can see, we can click on that. And just like in sort of the previous, previous version, we can scan that container. So the only way that I was able to get this to show the scanning interface is because I went and added that as one of those custom fields that we were talking about. Um, and so I had to add that and show it as a type of scanning, since this is a new field type. Um, but I was showing that in this. So you can see here that I have the input mode as scanning for the WHS field input mode. Okay, so then we can um, scan the container. You can see the container ID is scanned up here. We can enter the weight, and then the weight's going to be saved, and it's asking us to do it before. So that's exactly the same process for creating custom uh, workflows that you have previously done and um, largely unchanged, largely the same code. Uh, as I said, the, the, the one piece that you'll need to make sure that you add in will be if you have any sort of custom um, controls or custom fields that are not in covered by one of the other warehouse flows, you will have to um, add in this, uh, have to extend from this WHS field. Okay. Great. So, um, I think that at this point, I think I can um, open up and see if there's any questions that have been asked. Okay. All right. But thanks, everyone. I hope this was helpful to get an understanding of the warehouse mobile app, both in terms of, of how to configure it and how to run some of the warehousing workflows. And so thank you very much. I'm going to hand it back over to Janice. Thanks again. All right. Thank you, Zach. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring your attention to a link that I popped into the messages panel. That's a link to a short survey for this web conference, and we ask that you please take a moment before logging out to access it. We hope that you found today's information helpful, and if you enjoyed today's web conference or uh, have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, this is your chance to let us know. The survey scores are on a scale from 1 to 5, with 5 being the highest score possible. And with that, I still don't see any questions in the Q&A panel, so that's going to conclude today's web conference. Uh, attendees can access a web conference recording by a link that will be delivered within three to five business days post-conference. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Zach, and thank you, audience, for logging in and joining us today. You may now disconnect from the broadcast.